today to learn a little bit more about the Kaizen way. And uh, today I'm very excited about this presentation. I received this book um, many years ago, thanks to Bob Kinney and read it multiple times. So we've been very excited about this webinar today. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that uh, while you are not in a breakout room to please put your microphones on mute. And this recording, this will also be recorded. So uh, the presentation is recorded today. So I just wanna make sure that everyone is aware of that. But I'd like to welcome, uh, first of all, Bob Kinney. He is our uh, roundtable chairperson. He's also our membership chair and he is the owner of Accelerate Results Group. So please welcome Bob Kinney today and he's going to tell you a little bit more about this presentation. Thank you, Bob. Right. Hey, thanks, Beth. Yeah, I want to, uh, first I want to thank our presenter, uh, Dr. Robert Maurer, and I promise I won't uh, call you doctor anymore, Bob, for everyone will be, it'll be Bob Maurer from now on, but we're really excited to have him here uh, to share his expertise and his interesting perspective um, on Kaizen. And I'm sure you'll find it interesting and useful in both your professional and uh, personal life. Uh, so Bob uh, Maurer, he appears, he's appeared on uh, ABC's 2020. Um, USA Today uh, featured his bestseller that Beth just showed, uh, One Small Step Can Change Your Life. And then a Los Angeles Times profile highlighted uh, Dr. Maurer's seminars on creativity. Um, his presentations on success have reached audiences as diverse as corporations, hospital patients and staff, theatrical companies, and the British government. Thus, his work as a clinical psychologist has resulted in the development of an extensive series of programs designed to meet the challenges of building and sustaining our excellence and well-being. So when looking for an effective translator of a new psychology of success, we're gonna get the chance to experience the impact of Dr. Maurer's unique approach to personal happiness and success. So uh, Bob, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thanks again for being with us this morning. It's a privilege, Bob, and great to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> so. I wanted to spend some time talking about the history of Kaizen and about its approach, uh, give you a chance to explore it. We've got a lot of research on change and individual change seems very difficult. We have good research now on New Year's resolutions. And as you can see on the screen, the average ma ma American makes the exact same resolution 10 years in a row. Those who um, uh, fail usually have failed within 15 weeks and even those who succeed, it's usually five or six times, meaning five or six years. So change seems to us to be very difficult yeah. on an individual and an organizational level. But I'm here to convince you, if you are not aware of Kaizen, that it doesn't have to be that way. The change can be an exciting part of your organization and a, a relatively effortless way to improve. Um, as Mark Twain said, there's usually a fair amount of resistance in organizations to people making change. We all like the idea until we get uncomfortable with it. So basically what we found in our research is that there were two types of change. The one we are all familiar with is the Western notion of innovation, which we define as taking the largest possible steps to accomplish a large goal. And of course, innovation is good. If I ask you to list all the things you want for yourself, your loved ones, your, your team, your organization, why would you wait one minute longer than necessary to accomplish them? But as you've all lived long enough to discover, sometimes those big steps lead to big falls. And sometimes the price of that fall is more than we bargained to pay. So what we found in our success studies was that uh, successful people fell back on a second strategy, which currently goes by the name of Kaizen. Now Kaizen has two definitions. The one we start with is making very, very small steps to accomplish a large goal. So innovation, the largest possible steps to accomplish a goal, Kaizen, the smallest, most trivial steps in order to get to that same destination. Now, logically, it just doesn't seem probable that you can get to the same place with small steps that you get with large steps. So let me just show you a few generic kinds of studies before we get to, to your world. But first, the history of it. Um, as you know, the United States entered World War II very suddenly, and we had very little human and material resources. We were turning car factories into tank factories. So a man named Edward Deming 
and his colleagues came up with a process for the factories, which they called training within industries. As you can see a quote from that manual, job methods will help supervisors to make many small improvements on the job they're closest to. Those that could be made without wholesale design of machines or tools or department layouts. And what they found through these very small incremental changes they were making on the assembly line, they were turning out some of the highest quality military products. After the war, nobody was interested in Deming's funny ideas about quality. We were the only industrial giant standing. People were buying our cars and refrigerators no matter how we built them. But a small struggling firms at the time like Toyota, Honda, Fuji invited Deming and his colleagues over and used some of the ideas to begin building some of the highest quality products in the world. And so he, he collaborated with Taichi Ona at Toyota, which was one of the first companies to embrace his ideas. <coughs> which, and then they elaborated on it, as you can see from this um, quote from one of the early chairmen of Toyota, the soul of the Toyota production system is a principle called Kaizen. Its essence is the notion that engineers, managers, and critically line workers collaborate continually to systematize production tasks and identify incremental, that's the key change, to make work go more smoothly, which led to lean production and Six Sigma. So, uh, Kaizen is the birth mother of the whole quality control movement. Right. So and what I want to show you is one of the first um, TV shows that, that demonstrated um, how powerful Toyota had come in the American culture. Right. Analysts say Toyota's success is not just about car design and reliability. It's also about a corporate culture that seems designed to win. NBC News correspondent Ron Mott takes us inside a Toyota plant in Kentucky. The cars may be high tech at Toyota. This color looks pretty good. Then we'll take a look at the red. But employees like Howard Artrip are expected to find simpler ways to build them. It minimize the parts handling for the team member. One idea: using plastic totes to separate parts by the car model, not by the type of part. We actually bought these from Walmart down the street. The Japanese call this kind of thinking Kaizen, or continuous improvement, which Toyota has embraced wholeheartedly just about everywhere you look at its seven North American assembly plants. Take these motorized carts, for example. Toyota used to buy them, but after opening one, discovered car parts could be used instead. This one is actually steered by the power window motor. By building these carts themselves, Toyota has cut its costs in half. And savings of $3,000 a cart is just a small part of Toyota's overall good fortune, which continues to elude their American competitors. It's not just the Toyota culture. It's the Japanese culture that they've brought to corporate America. And they've melded in such a way that takes the benefits of both. Those benefits led to record sales last year at Toyota, but don't expect a big party here. It's not to say that Toyota doesn't recognize its accomplishments but if there is a uh, healthy sense of paranoia that that's not enough. That's why every worker is empowered to yank the line to a halt if they see a problem. In the Toyota system, no problem equals a problem. So we want to expose problems. Problems expose opportunities for solutions. At the end of the day, if you see a change and my job is better, my process has improved, it makes you want to come back. Back to keep Toyota moving forward toward number one in the world. Ron Mott, NBC News, Georgetown, Kentucky. Now, uh, Deming used to preach to his audiences. It took about three years to, to create a Kaizen culture. I think he was lying, but he knew how, how impatient we are for results. And he wanted people to realize this isn't just a management strategy or a tool, but a way of thinking. I don't know if you remember that place where they showed the, how they got those bins from Walmart. Imagine a line worker, the story was a line worker was reaching for a bolt and asked the supervisor, what does this bin cost? And the, and the foreman said, why do you want to know? He said, well, I saw bins that looked just like it at Walmart. They researched it, found the bins that Toyota was using were roughly $40. And that Walmart had virtually the same thing for, ten, for a fraction of that cost. So the point of it being that what, what does it take for a man who's reaching for a bolt in a, in a bag to put on a, a, a tire to, to think in terms of, I wonder if there's a less expensive and higher quality product that could hold these bolts. So Kaizen as a mindset, as a 
philosophy as an approach to life takes a little bit of practice. So again, let me just show you some generic examples because it just doesn't seem possible you can get to the same place with small steps that you get to with large steps. American Cancer Society, very interested in getting people to donate money for research. So they came up with a sales pitch they were using door to door to get people to give. And it was reasonably effective. Roughly 40% of people would donate, average donation $3. They then added Kaizen to the sales pitch. At the end of the pitch, they said, even a penny will help. Can't get any smaller than that, right? The rate of donation jumped from 40% to 60%, but strangely, the rate of donation jumped from an average of $3 to $5. A study done originally in Tucson and then repeated at five other sites throughout the United States. They would identify a census tract that was as similar as they could find in terms of number of people living in houses, ages, ethnicity, education, income. Arbitrarily, they divided the tract in half on day one. Neighborhood A, they left alone. Neighborhood B, not so lucky. Volunteer knocked on each door and says, automobiles are a major health hazard in the United States. 30 to 40,000 people killed every year in car accidents, hundreds of thousands more injured. Would you be willing to put this sticker on your front door that just says, be a safe driver to remind people as they knocked on your door of this very important health habit? On average, in these five neighborhoods, over 80% of people agreed to this modest request. Two weeks later, another volunteer knocks on the doors of neighborhood A and B. Same pitch, automobiles are major health hazard, da 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 da, da. only now the request is a bit more bizarre. Would you be willing to let us put a billboard in the front yard of your house for 30 days that says, be a safe driver? And just so there's no doubt what they were asking, they held up a photograph. This billboard was so huge, it would dwarf your house for a month. No sunlight for 30 days. On average, 17% of these people in neighborhood A agreed to this ridiculous request. Wouldn't you love to sell them something? On average, 75% of the people in neighborhood B did. Having made that three inch commitment, they were four times more likely to make the large one. In the world of sales, from the American Salesman Magazine, the general idea is to pave the way for a full line distribution by starting with a small order. Look at it this way. When a person has signed an order for your merchandise, even though the profit is so small, it hardly compensates for the time and the effort of making the call, they're no longer a prospect, they're a customer. So I'm not going to give you time to read this. I, my website was on that first page. You can download all these slides and even uh, much more detail. So ultradian rhythms is one of the great mysteries in medical science. For reasons nobody's been able to figure out, the brain has about a 90-minute cycle. You dream every 90 minutes. So what this Harvard Business Review um, researcher did was went to several corporations. CPA was one of them, but several other businesses where they could measure productivity and asked the experimental group, every 90 minutes, we'd like you to take a two or three minute break. Go get a glass of water, go up a flight of stairs, check the sports scores, anything other than the task you're on, every 90 minutes, um, take this two or three minute break compared to the control group, which didn't do that. And by whatever measures of productivity, the group that honored the, the three minute break, um, productivity was much higher. Again, we'll, we'll stay with health for just a little while, even though that's not our major focus today, but just to show you the power of small steps. A study of 60,000 women revealed that eating one or more servings of fatty fish per week reduced the risk of a not uncommon cancer, kidney cancer, by 74%. <clears throat> Accumulating bouts of brisk walking just three minutes each for a total of 30 minutes improved several measures of cardiac risk as effectively as one continuous 30 minute session. The great news in this, if you ask your employees or if I ask you, like you to exercise 30 minutes a day, they're gonna think, where did Bob find this guy? He has no idea what a day of my life is like. Who has time in our busy lives to drive to the gym, change your clothes, exercise, to shower, put your clothes back on and go back to work. Most of us don't have that kind of freedom. But if I ask you to walk a little faster from the parking lot, ask you to walk up a flight of stairs for just two or three minutes at a time, just to get your heart rate up, does that seem more doable? Subjects exercising for 15 minutes a day live three years longer than those who did less in a study of over 400,000 Taiwanese adults. Just a few more on health. 
Uh, this is a study that's um, been repeated several times. 787 offer, office workers, 351 randomly selected to receive a weekly email and midweek reminders about one of three health promoting behaviors. <clears throat> So they chose whether they wanted a reminder about boosting physical activity, increasing fruit or vegetable intake, or decreasing sugar and, and saturated fats. Emails were brief and contained a small goal, a reminder to go for a walk, order a salad for lunch, uh, and those kinds of things. <clears throat> At the end of the 16 weeks, the experimental groups increased their uh, exercise by an average of an hour a week more than the control group reduce saturated and trans fats by more than a gram a day, increase food and consumption. So again, some companies with the best of intentions put in these very expensive health clubs and wellness programs. Um, you can get some of the same results for next to nothing. So just a few more. Framingham is one of the most famous studies, a suburb of Boston where since 1984, they've been following these 5,000 adults. Um, to this day, they found that whatever way you started from, if you lost one pound a year for four years and kept it off, you reduce your chances of developing hypertension, high blood pressure by 25%. There's a huge research now on sitting versus standing. The Mayo Clinic developed something called data logging underwear, basically a pedometer you wore. And they looked at people who were relatively thin and fit versus those who were overweight and found these thin people, none of whom had trainers, didn't go to gyms, didn't buy fancy $2,000 bikes. They simply moved more during the day. They parked at the end of the Costco lot and walked. On the escalator, they would walk instead of standing still. They would take a flight of stairs when it was possible. They simply moved more during the day, which added up to, as you can see here, a 350 calorie day difference, but 350 calories a day, which is a small sandwich over the course of a year is 30 to 40 pounds. So again, from the Mayo Clinic, just going from sitting to standing doubles your metabolic rate. And excuse me, the um, chief cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic found if you're sitting most of the day, now what this means is, because many of us sit in, job, in a desk all day, if you get up once an hour for once or two minutes, this, this risk disappears. So we're not talking about going to the gym every hour, but just getting up and stretching. For people who sit most of the day, the risk of a heart attack is about the same as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Mm -hmm. Now NASA tried to figure out why sitting was so dangerous for us. The human body is designed to function with a constant downward pull of gravity. Without it, the heart shrinks, blood volume plunges, muscles atrophy, fat replaces muscles, and bone mass decreases. When you sit for long periods of time, the muscles in the legs and back go dormant. Calorie burning plummets. It slows the breakdown of dangerous blood fats, lowering the good cholesterol. So again, let's get to the world of business because that's obviously our, our major focus here. But I just wanted you to see the power of this in each part of our lives. Um, Tom Kelly, you may know the IDEO company is one of the most creative companies in the world. They're located in, in, in the uh, Silicon Valley and have been, made many innovative products. To change a customer's experience with your service or product, start by taking little steps. Changing a single ingredient can sometimes make a big difference and you'll get to meet him. Now there's two essential elements of, of, of Kaizen. One is taking very, very small steps, but the small steps have to be uh, to increase quality and or reduce costs and always in the service of the customer. Um, almost every month, Consumer Reports magazine will show you, for example, a bag of potato chips um, and while the potato chip flavor and whatnot and consistency is fine, the size of the bag is of the bag has stayed the same. The price has stayed the same. They've just reduced the number of potato chips. Call that whatever you want, but it's not Kaizen. Kaizen is always in the service of the customer, increasing quality and reducing cost. <coughs> so, why has the customer experience? Um, what, the service is not only to the customer, but the customer also including your staff. So I want you to hear a very brief segment uh, at the Stanford Business School, the second CEO of Southwest Airlines talking about their criteria for employees. Why has the customer experience that we've adopted not been uh, adopted by other carriers? Um, I ask myself that at least once a week. Um, I'll tell you what I think it is, and I hope it doesn't sound, um, 
cocky or, or arrogant. I, I think it's because it's so simple that, pe that people don't believe what it is. I, I mean, I really, I really believe that. I mean, we have companies that come in and visit us. I mean, I could do benchmark visits every day of the week if, if that's how many demands or requests we get. I sit there and I talk to people about how we treat our employees. And I know that they write me off as this, you know, I don't know, mushy part person. It's, there's nothing mushy about it. We are very forgiving if people are slow to learn a skill. We're not real forgiving um, if people do not adopt our philosophy in terms of the way that you treat people. All right. <laughs> so just another example of this um, with uh, an example cl close to your home. Ahead of this year's Chevrolet product blitz, General Motors company is getting some advice from the mouse house on making a connection with customers. GM has quietly sent about 2,300 of its dealers and 600 of its Chevrolet division employees to three-day Disney Institute training sessions in Orlando, Florida and Anaheim, California over the last year. Participants get a living laboratory experience of how Walt Disney managers get 70% of the people that walk through the theme park gates to return. The sad same loyalty rate, if translated to Chevrolet, could substantially boost profitability. Think of all the applicable lessons you can get from Disney that you can then turn around and institute in your own organization. <laughs> Last month, 40 dealers witnessed the rose drop at Cinderella Castle on Space Mountain. Although the park officially opens at 9 a.m., the company always lets customers in five minutes early. How many of you have people in place you can open five minutes ahead of time every day? Think of the message that sends if you open your doors instead of letting someone sit out in your lot. Those kind of small gestures. So I want to give you a chance to get in a breakout room for just five minutes to see if you can think small. Because again, we live in a Western culture. We tend to think big problem, big solution. We're not trying to make innovation bad or wrong. Um, there's a time and place for it. The question is, is your nervous system, is your brain an equal opportunity employer? Can you think small as easily as you can think big so you can decide which of these strategies is appropriate given whatever circumstance you're in? So this is a real example. And again, uh, as soon as I give you the instructions, Bob will put you in um, uh, breakout rooms for just five minutes to come up with a solution. So here's the problem. Kaizen encourages looking for simple solutions to problems. The IDEO company, which I mentioned earlier, the Silicon Valley company, was asked to help with a problem at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. The hospital, it seemed, had been designed without adequate elevators for the rush hour at lunchtime. The crush of staff, patients, families, and doctors slowed the elevators and made it difficult for employees to get to the cafeteria or to patients or to anywhere else they needed to go. Building a new bank of elevators would have solved the problem, but at a staggering expense. So here's your challenge. You have five minutes to come up with a solution that costs $5 or less. Now, I'll just give you one clue. You can't stagger the lunch hour. You've got 1,100 employees. People would have to start going to lunch as soon as they showed up for work in order to get everybody fed by the close of workday. So you have five minutes in your breakout rooms and then we'll hear from any of you that, um, any brave souls that want to tell us what you came up with for $5 or less. All right, have fun. All right, I'll set up the break room. So we're going to have. Yeah. I have lunch, little mini lunch rooms in different areas. Okay, you should get an invitation. Thanks for your help, Bob. Yeah, hey, Bob. So then it uh, it says close all rooms. So we have uh, five minutes is 1030, correct? Our, our time. Yes. Okay. And then I, I guess I just, uh, so I can broadcast a message to all. Yeah. And then we uh, bring them back. Okay.
anxious to see what they come up with. Uh-huh. Anxious to see how this works. <laughs> I'm going to send them a one minute. Okay. Okay, I'm bringing them back, Bob. Okay, thank you. Oh, when I did that, that gives them 60 seconds, so. Right. No yeah. problem. Hey, just I'm curious. Have, have any of you guys seen the movie What About Bob? Yeah. <laughs> Cause, cause this is so apropos. I mean, we we because you know one of the big things that I always tell my wife, we joke around like baby steps, baby steps. And, That's it, Pete. Yeah. Yeah. 
if we got Bob Kinney and Robert Maurer here, the, we got Bob's baby steps. Bob's baby steps. <laughs> in, the, in, the long, in the longer programs, Pete, I actually showed that beginning with that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Pete, you also remind me of office space. I've got a meeting yeah. with the Bobs. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Is that not one of the best movies ever? I love that. Very, <laughs> very true. Very true. Right. Are you uh, sitting out in our warehouse, Pete? <laughs> All right. Somebody come up with a solution? Yeah, we have one. Our group did. All right, Diane. Okay, so we had a three-prong approach, and um, this was Carl and Cliff and I were all three in the same group, so we want to give credit to everybody in the group. Um, a pre-order, pre-packaged delivery to floors was part of a solution. A schedule that rotated days where a hot lunch could be achieved by going down and using the elevators, um, or also, and then rotate the box day as well. So there'd be a rotated schedule uh, based on floor, and the stairs in in uh, implementing a wellness campaign in order to encourage people to use the stairs, not just the elevator, but also, you know, in, maybe even commute com and, and encourage a little competition, right, between floors and you have a little wellness campaign. And the third one was a winner. Small solution worked. They started a stair climbing contest. They put up a sign saying, did you take the stairs? Staff were given stickers to put on a wall list with their names every time they used the stairs. Problem solved. Well done. All right, so again, challenge is to think small. So <laughs> again, um, this is a wonderful book written by, again, one of the uh, founders of uh, the IDEO company, breaking down seemingly large problems into miniature experiments to the point where lo and behold, you've generated system change without even knowing it. The power is in making lots of little steps at the same time, building momentum and optimism the sense that one of a combination of approaches will deliver the necessary improvements. Just one, another quote from Toyota, um, and again from several other companies, what set the operations of such company apart is the way they tightly couple the process of doing work with the process of learning to do it better as it's being done. They're learning organizations. Operations are expressively designed to reveal problems as they occur. When they arise, no matter how trivial, they're addressed more quickly. And we'll talk about how mistakes, how Kaizen relationship to mistakes. All right. <laughs> People don't typically go in for big dramatic cure-alls. Instead, they break big problems down into smaller tractable pieces and generate a steady rush of iterative changes that collectively deliver spectacular results. So let's go back to Toyota because it's the one company in the world who identifies themselves the most with Kaizen, they call it their soul. So when they came to the US, they were selling a thousand cars a month. GM was selling that many a day. By strategic design, they established a 2% share in 1970. By strategic design, they leaped to 3% a decade later. A decade later, 8% share of the US car market. They even had a name for it, they called it Jojo. Now, and again, they got a lot of good publicity. Kaizen, the well-known Japanese process of continuous improvement. Kaizen is more a frame of mind than a business process, which is what Deming was preaching. Toyota workers come to work each day determined to become a little better at whatever it is they're doing than they were the day before. But as you may know, Toyota got themselves into some real bad trouble. Um, <clears throat> So they, I stopped counting after 11 million recalls and one of the largest fines the US government's ever placed on a company because they were hiding some of their mistakes. Um, so if Kaizen's such a great idea and Toyota's the poster child for Kaizen, what could possibly go wrong? Well, by 2002, they were by most measures the most successful car company in the world. They made $9 billion profit that year, more than any Japanese company has made in the history of, of Japan. At the same year, General Motors was losing billions. Consumer Reports magazine stopped even testing their cars. If Toyota built them, they recommended them. But a new administration came in and said, not good enough. We now want to be the biggest car company in the world. And they began building 14 factories around the world simultaneously without the engineering and technical support. This was a, an email we got from 2005. We make so many cars in so many different places with so many people. Our greatest fear that as we keep growing, our ability to maintain the discipline of Kaizen will be lost, which is exactly what happens. 
At their core was an attention to detail and noble frugality that shunned waste of every kind as Ono and Teichi Ono uh, concepts were handed down to successive generations of Toyota executives, the purity of the message seems to have been slowly lost. And this was a more blunt assessment from the highest ranking American in the Toyota system at the time. So I want you to just hear it for just one more second. But the company wanted more. Toyota set its sights on becoming the world's number one car maker. That would take a massive step change in production. By the end of 2002, Toyota's global sales helped it to an operating profit of more than $8 billion. Then the highest ever figure for a Japanese company in any industry. But today, 2002 has taken on a different significance in the Toyota story. All right, I think you get the point. And Volkswagen also decided at one point they wanted to be the biggest car company in the world and started cutting corners and you know how that ended. <laughs> so again, back to some of Toyota's uh, tools. The computer room was too warm. The easy answer would have been to dial down air conditioning, but following the company's principles, workers tracked down the root cause of block duck. By following Kaizen, a problem was fixed without extra costs. Workers also found they had excess office supplies languishing on sell shelves, so they created an intranet trading post. Workers with too much of something, file folders, binders, sharpies, copier, toner, whatever, listed and employees in other departments can come by to trade or plunder. It might seem small, but if one department uses the excess of another department, there's some significant cost savings. All these cost savings add up. So again, I want to skip one of these. Uh, Herb Keller, the, one of the, the two founders of Southwest Airlines, we asked our people to cut our non-fuel costs. I wrote a letter asking each of them to save $5 a day. Sounds like nothing, but believe me, the little things can really add up. By each saving $5 a day, our people at Southwest helped cut our costs last year by 5.6%. <clears throat> Howard Schultz, you may know, heard of Starbucks. The only way we can succeed and sustain growth and innovation is linked to the basic element of one cup of coffee, one customer, one barista at a time. <coughs> at McDonald's, at the expansion of McDonald's was getting underway in the 50s, Ray Kroc, the company's empire builder, listed cleanliness among the chain's three key values, along with service and quality. But he did not talk cleanliness, an early employee of the Chicago area McDonald's remembered him personally picking up trash around the restaurant and scraping up gum with a putty knife. Message, cleanliness counts, and if cleanliness isn't beneath me, it isn't beneath you. <clears throat> and a powerful book about change called Switch. There is a clear asymmetry between the scale of the problem and the scale should be of the solution. Big problem, small solution. This, and again, we sometimes think that these uh, discoveries come with big ahas, but often it's some small moment, as I'll show you in a minute, but the man, you know, given credit for um, the invention of the internet. Journalists have often asked me, what was the crucial idea, Liza, or the single event that allowed the web to exist one day when it hadn't before? They're frustrated when I tell them there was no eureka moment. It was not like the legendary apple falling on Newton. Newton's head to demonstrate the concept of gravity. It was a process of accretion. And the man given credit for developing the laser. In the middle of one Saturday night, the whole thing suddenly popped into my head and I saw how to build the laser. But that flash of insight required the 20 years of work I'd done in physics and optics but to put all the bricks of the invention together. So, so a piece of this obviously. So I want you to meet the man who started IDEO and now he runs a, a program at, at Stanford. Um, talking about how, if you decide you want to make small steps in your team, how do you bring this in an organization so this doesn't look like just one more huge fad that are going on? So a piece of this obviously is uh, instilling in individuals this, this creative confidence. But you know, in the real world, when these students graduate and they go off and they work in companies or they start a company yeah. or something, they're going to be working in teams, um, yeah. probably interesting interdisciplinary teams. So part of the, of the dynamic here, it seems to me, is that we, we, you have to, to find a way for teams to be accepting. 
you know, of the inputs that individuals, even if the individuals are themselves creative, how do you, how do you make sure that the teams are going to be open to crazy ideas and that they won't reject things out of, out of hand because they, they're crazy ideas and so on? Right. Yeah. So um, that's a very hard problem. And that's all the things we do. We work on with uh, our exec ed programs and with uh, the different things we do at IDEO, like going back to your company and how do you integrate this new thinking into it? And so that's quite difficult. But the, but the main, um, uh, the main tenet, well, there's two actually. The first one is, um, uh, is as we call a bias towards action. So somehow, um, so you have to picture you have two teams. One team's doing it the way they've been doing it for, and that's their habit, you know, which is okay, but a, a problem. And then they got the new team that's come back all of these new tools, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the the thing about the the our 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 team is that we this bias for action. So they just start doing stuff. You know, they just, you know, the normal team will um, do lots of planning. We're not big on planning. We're big on planning after you have the idea, but not planning before. So they'll do cash flow analysis out 10 years, right? But they don't have an idea yet, right? So, and you know, everybody's in these rooms with their pads of paper and talking to each other. And our team's out in the field, talking to the customers, making prototypes, all that kind of stuff. So um, it's like, if, it, if it's a race, we, like we jump, we jump out of the box and do and get as much real, de real understanding. We kind of, you know, um, know the state of the art and stuff. And so, so somebody notices that this team is is uh, doing a good job. And so uh, that, but the, but I'd say the main thing is, is that um, we instill in the team a culture of prototyping, uh, of experimenting, right, or prototyping. So. Um, so let's say that, you know, you want the, your job is to get all the lawyers out of their, I've had this problem. You want to get all the lawyers out of their private offices and put them into the, uh, the center of the room and have them work together in an open plan system. That's a tough problem. Anyway, um, so the only way you could possibly do that is to have a, ser you know, like a series of, of um, experiments. And you have to promise them if they don't like it as a group, if they don't like the new thing I've proposed, mm -hmm. then you can go back to the old way and go back to your habit. And you have to have kind of, you know, it has to be a meritocracy. You actually, ha it has to be actually better, right? That's always a problem. Uh, you can't sell, you know, the wrong thing. But, um, and so what we found is in all these big problems is that in these companies um, is that the teams can, um, can make their mark, can prove that this is a worthy way to go by doing a bunch of small experiments, you know, like setting a bunch of small brush fires in different places. And if they really are experiments, then some of them you say that didn't work and I go back and start over. And that kind of gets you the respect of the whole place that you're not crazy, that you're not just, you know, this isn't like some kind of new religious thing you're, you're on, you know, that you learned at a conference, you know, that you go, if it doesn't work, you go back and stuff. So, um, the way that you uh, convince a culture, if you're the if you're the person bringing back this new tool, mm -hmm. um, the way you convince them is through starting some really interesting experiments. And because they're experiments, it doesn't threaten anybody. If I come back and say, I, I went to the D school, we got this new, we went to the boot camp and stuff, and now we're going to change all this, right? If I had the power to do that even, which you usually don't. Mm -hmm. um, then that would scare everybody. But you know, I learned saying, hey, I'm gonna try this little thing over here. I'm gonna try this little thing over here. What do you think, mm -hmm. right? So it has to be uh, a, a culture of experimentation uh, that allows it to catch hold. And then you do, you can get a force fire going if you get enough of these little things. All right. So this quote you've all seen before, I hope you will never look at the same again. And we all grew up with the story of small versus large steps. So now why does Kaizen work? How many of you have had this experiment? Uh, you're driving to work, you're putting in, on makeup, you're in the shower, you're shaving, and all of a sudden you get a solution to a problem. All of, all, almost all of us, yes? Do you know how you did that? Well, we don't either. Nobody really knows how the brain creates a thought. But let's back up. What did Dr. Deming do at Toyota? So how many of you had this experiment? The same thing. Um, so what did Dr. Deming do? Um, uh, so suppose all of you work for Toyota. This is our staff meeting. And I say to you, what are you going to do to make Toyota the greatest car company in the world? In that, in that tone of voice, what emotion does that trigger in you? Fear, obviously. And what does fear do to creativity? Second chapter of Dr. Deming, Dr. Deming's textbook is called Getting Fear Out of the Workplace. 
The second thing Deming suspected, and we still believe to be true, though nobody knows why, is for reasons nobody's been able to figure out, the brain cannot reject a question. Any question you ask repeatedly, the brain's compelled to pay attention to. Um, if I'm doing a five-day program in a hotel, pre-COVID, of course, on the first day, I'll say to the audience, how many of you drove here today? If everyone raises their hand. What color car was parked two cars to the right of yours in the parking lot? They look at each other like, where'd they find this guy? That's the dumbest question I ever heard. I ask them that same stupid question on Tuesday, same by Wednesday at the earliest, Thursday at the latest, pulling into the parking lot with far more important things on their mind. A place in the brain called the hippocampus will say, that fool's gonna ask me again what the color of the car is, and they're forced to store an answer in short-term memory. The brain cannot reject a question. So all Dr. Deming asked the Toyota workers to do as they were literally rebuilding out of rubble is ask a question each day. What small trivial step could I take that may improve the process or product? Just ask the question. He thought because it was small, it wouldn't trigger fear. And because it was a question, the brain would be compelled in its own magical way to start popping out answers. Now, the last numbers we have are actually from 2002, quite dated. Average US automobile worker, General Motors, Chrysler, Ford was making again on average two suggestions every three years. Average reward was $450 per suggestion. Average Toyota worker in Europe, Asia, or the United States was making over 200 suggestions per year. Average reward was $3.87. Now Deming preached people had to feel they were being paid fairly for their labor or all bets were off. But he thought once people were being paid fairly, big rewards were a terrible idea, with the exception of, say, assembly line kind of work. Because if you think there's a big reward waiting for a big idea, what are you looking for? Just big ideas missing many small ones. And for $450, am I going to bounce it off the people next to me on the assembly line to see if I should send it to management? That year, Toyota bragged they could use over 90% of the literally 1 million suggestions they were getting from their workforce worldwide. We asked them, what do you do with those 10% you can't use? They say, those in some ways are our best because if someone's giving us a really strange and inappropriate suggestion, we know we haven't trained them right. We can train them before they mess something up. So again, the power of questions. So we think there's four advantages to Kaizen. One is it trains the brain. We think it's the way the brain learns best. Second, it allows time for skills to, to develop. Now, example of this is John Wooden, who some of you may not know, by most measures, the most successful male athletic coach in world history. Um, 88 games, his UCLA basketball team won 88 games in a row without a defeat, 10 NCAA championships, seven in a row. We studied him not only because of his extraordinary accomplishments in his chosen career, but lived to his late 90s with an extraordinary marriage of over 50 years. When players came to him, the best in their high school class, he spent the entire week teaching them how to tie their shoes. That sound bizarre to you? How many times do you think these young men had tied their shoes before they got to a university? But he knew that basketball, like life, was a series of mastering small fundamental skills. If I can teach them to put on their socks correctly, tie their shoes correctly, the chance of a blister could be reduced. One blister could take them out of the game. When we interviewed his players 20 years later, who you'll hear from in a moment, and what they told us, whether it was their marriage, their parenting, their work, their spiritual practice, they tried to break it down into ridiculously small steps and learn it one small step at a time. Now, you're going to hear it in Coach Wooden's own words, but if we didn't have this frame of Kaizen, you might think this poor old man had lost some of his faculties. But first, a quote, my players would probably tell you they never heard me mention winning. I don't think scores indicated you won or lost. I want them to work each and every day to improve themselves. True conditioning for the coach meant an attention to detail that guarded against anything, no matter how small it seemed, that might interfere with a person's readiness to perform. Little things make big things happen. And one of the things that uh, players will lose some time and practice are blisters. They pick up blisters. You know, basketball is played on a hard floor. And uh, there's a lot of quick stops and turns and, and change of direction, change of pace. And, and that's bringing about blisters if you're not careful. So I wanted to stress that and try to prevent it. I, I believe in the prevention more than the cure until you get the problem, then I want the cure. But let's prevent it if we possibly can. And I taught my players, they used to laugh about it, how to put on their socks. And... Um, uh, 
I, I want them pulled on a certain way, pulled up. Yeah, the tendency for blisters is around the little toe area and around the heel area. And if you, in putting on your socks, will make sure, take a few seconds. This extra time to see that there are no wrinkles <coughs> around the little toe area and, and, and around the heel. And then you, if you get those, you won't have any wrinkles anyplace else. So you, you, it takes a little time at the stress and you pull up in the back and you, you know, hold them up while you put your shoes on so there'll be no, no blisters. And they used to laugh at me when I did that. It's the first day of practice, and here's the Wizard of Westwood, and it's so quiet, you can hear a pen drop in there. I mean, everyone's like, yeah, he's going to give us the pill. He's going to turn the key for us. And he says, now, guys, we will begin by learning how to tie our shoes. Did we look him up? <laughs> what it says. What are you talking about? I was an Indiana All-Star. We won a state championship. I had scored more field goals than Oscar Robertson in the state finals. I mean, it was like, now you're going to tell me how to put my socks on? Putting your socks on, gentlemen. There is a certain way that it has to be done. We take our socks and we gingerly over the toes. Start here on the little toes, on the little piggies. And pull them up. Pull it up real strong here. Nice and taut. Gotta just pull that up there. So that there's no wrinkles on the bottom of the socks. So you get wrinkles on the bottom of the socks. You get blisters on your feet. Blisters on your feet for a basketball player, that's no good. In terms of lacing your shoe up, start at the bottom. Lace the shoes up nice and snugly. Snug, 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 snug. There it is. I'm good to go. Put me in, coach. I'm ready. Come on. Now, this is okay sort of the first time when you're a freshman, but we do the same thing every year. All right, and I'll ask you to focus on the part in bold. This is Pat Riley, the famous National Basketball Association coach. We challenged each player to put forth enough effort to gain just 1% in percentage point in each of these five areas. We found this commonly in the success research, people challenging themselves to improve 1%. Now, what's the beauty of that? Is a 1% goal likely to send you into fear? Not likely. How do you make sure you stop at 1%? You can't. Third, increasing pleasures in daily life. <clears throat> Those of you that have raised children, there were times when they were young when you must have envied their ability to find pleasure in the smallest of things. It seems to be a gift we lose as the brain becomes adulterated. It may not be that children are more spiritually evolved than us. It may be simply because their brains are literally physically so much smaller. It lacks the software the brain develops as it grows that allows us to remember the past and anticipate the future. This was life-saving software 10,000 years ago when you came out of your cave to recall what direction the lions were heading yesterday and try to anticipate where the water might be today. Given all the protection of civilization, that software tends to be misused. To live in regrets of the past and worry about the future, we lose that ability to take pleasure in just what's happening this moment. I don't know if any of you remember the TV show All in the Family. It was produced by a man named Norm Norman Lear, who by most criteria is the most successful producer in Hollywood history. He said this better than I. Success is how you collect your minutes. You spend millions of minutes to reach one triumph, one moment, then you spend maybe a thousand minutes enjoying it. If you are unhappy through those millions of minutes, what good is a thousand minutes of triumph? It doesn't equate. How many successful people end up in suicides? Life is made of small pleasures, good eye contact over the breakfast table with your wife, a moment of touching a friend. Happiness is made of those tiny successes. The big ones come too infrequently. If you don't have all those zillions of tiny successes, the big ones don't mean anything. I don't know what my relationship to society is. Are people less bigoted than they were before all in the family? If there's one thing I want my children to learn from me, it's to take pleasure in life's daily small successes. It's the most important thing I've learned in 57 years. And finally, comfort in the overwhelming crisis. Crisis is something we have no control over, whether it's a financial reversal, a marriage that's struggling, a child who's floundering, uh, a health issue. If we could take a big step and make them go away, it's not a crisis. All we have to move forward in crisis are small steps. So our first definition of Kaizen, making very, very small steps to accomplish large goals. Our second definition we discovered when we looked at breakthroughs in science, business, and art, and found much to our surprise, it was rarely some big aha, but often some ridiculously small moment, 
so small most people wouldn't even pay attention to it, this person thought worthy of a second look. Now, it won't take time to go through all of these, but um, I'll take you through just a few I think you might be most interested in. We got Disneyland from two, uh, Disney taking his two young daughters to an amusement park. Puts them on the ride, sits on the bench, collects them, puts them on the second ride, sits on the second bench, collects them. By the third ride and the third bench, feeling rather bored and looking around at the other adults who looked just as bored as he was, he thought there must be a way for a family to share an amusement park together. And Disneyland was invented on that third bench. We got the credit card from two New York City businessmen out to dinner. At one point, they're arguing over the check until both of them realized neither of them had any money. One of them lived a few blocks from the uh, restaurant, borrowed the restaurant's phone. His wife came down in with some cash. On the walk back to the apartment, the two businessmen thought there must be an easier way to deal with restaurant charges and Diners Club, our first uh, credit card was invented that night. We got barcodes from a gentleman trying to help grocery stores with their checkout process. Couldn't figure out how to speed it up. One day, feeling very sorry for himself, he goes off to the beach, staring at the waves, sticking his hand in the sand in frustration, took his hand out, saw the sand sticking to the grooves on his fingers, and barcodes were invented that day. All right, if you insist, Viagra was a cardiac drug that didn't seem to have any good effects on the heart, but somebody noticed an interesting side effect. I'll leave it there. We got Airbnb from two guys who were just about to be evicted from their apartment. Um, there was, as is often, a huge convention in San Francisco and not enough hotel rooms. I believe they put an ad on Craigslist. Uh, they had air mattresses on the floor in their apartment and rented that and had air mattresses at some ridiculous price. That's how Airbnb got its name. And Velcro from a gentleman taking burrs off his dog. Now, again, first person to take burrs off his dog, hardly. I'll give you one more example that's not on this list. One of my favorites is the invention of the potato chip. Up, <clears throat> upstate New York, excuse me. Upstate New York restaurant, a waitress brings back some French fries to the cook and says um, the customer doesn't like them, says they're too thick. Well, this cook was angry. So he said, I'll show him. He cut these French fries as thin as he could and practically burnt them to a crisp sent them out again. Not only did the customer love them, but the waitress said some of the other customers in the restaurant would like the same thing. And potato chips were invented. So our second definition of Kaizen, using very, very small moments to learn large lessons. So just some other examples. Intuit founder Scott Cook got the idea for Quicken Financial Software after he watched his wife struggle to keep track of their tax receipts. <coughs> Tata Motors, you may know, a huge company in India got the inspiration that led to the world's cheapest car by observing the plight of a family of four packed onto a single motorized scooter. In 2009, he launched a $2,500 car. Whoops. So I'll need your help. I want to make another point on Kaizen. I'll put something up on the screen and ask you just to, I'll ask you to do it silently because I want to make sure we have time to get through most of this. Whether you think the thing is large and important, innovation, or small and trivial Kaizen. All right, so suppose you and I are having a conversation um, and uh, about um, it's politics or about the election or about finances or some major social issue going on. And all of a sudden I hold up the knife they give us in the restaurant and I say, hold on a minute, Drew. Um, how, they taught us in physics that atoms are always in motion. If that's the case, how could this knife be solid? Would you think, my God, this organization attracts some brilliant thinkers? This is a bright man innovation. Or how many think, doesn't this man have anything more important to worry about? When was the last time he saw the news? Kaizen. So uh, innovation or Kaizen, got it? What about the stirrup, that thing on the side of the saddle? How many of you think it's one of the great inventions in the history of the world? And how many think in the grand scheme of things is pretty trivial? I hope you're playing. Falling in love. How many of you was it love at first sight? How many of you, is it a small series of small steps over time? And how many of you don't want to talk about it? And I hope you found that funny. Um, and some health habit, one day you woke up and you said, that's it. Gave up smoking, gave up drinking too much, whatever it was. That morning you made a commitment and you kept it. Do you consider that a big, bold step innovation or Kaizen? All right, you got your answers? What's the point of these silly questions? 
Well, Feynman thought his question was trivial. Feynman even thought his answer was trivial. The Nobel Prize Committee did not agree. If you, any of you are historians, you might know that the stirrup was one of the great inventions in the history of our species, sadly, in one, some sense, because those lords who saw the implications of a stirrup could now train soldiers to sit on a horse holding a lance braced by the stirrup and ruled Europe until gunpowder came along. Falling in love, of course, can be either. And the research on health habits argues even people have made those big leaps, as some of you have. In virtually every case, it was preceded by days, weeks, months, frequently years of contemplation, consideration, discussion, and debate within our mind before that fateful day when the brain made the leap into innovation. So what's the point of this other than not to trust me again? The point is we have this fantasy, this myth, this delusion, this hallucination that we can control the size and speed of the result by the size and speed of the step. And think the bigger and the faster the step we take, the bigger and the faster result we'll get. When in fact, we often have little control over what at the end of the day turns out to be large and important. And what at the end of the day remains small and trivial. Now that you don't trust me at all, anyone consider the laser a Kaizen step? What about the radio, small step? What about the computer? Some days we wish it were. Are any of these trivial steps? Well, the people at the Bell Laboratories uh, did not apply for a patent for the laser for over two years, so no use for it. Marconi thought the only use we'd have for the radio is if the telegraph failed. You may know the president and CEO of IBM was offered the patent for the computer, and what one otherwise visionary man said, quote, I think there's a world market for about five computers, unquote. Now, in fairness to the man, a PC was a larger than a, 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 a two-story building, and IBM was doing a fine job selling us what? Typewriters, and they work great. And the people that invented transistors thought they'd be useful in hearing aids did not realize they had just made computers possible. So again, same point, we have no control over what at the end of the day turns out to be large and important, and what at the end of the day remains small and trivial. As Tom Kelly said, you start small experiments and see where they're going to take you. So for a long time, I thought Kaizen innovation were completely separate. Two examples of things I think you can only call innovation. When Walt Disney finally succeeded in making those short black and white cartoons, many of you have seen Steamboat Willie and some of those others, that was a decade of struggle. When he finally succeeded, he bet every penny he had, every penny he could borrow, mortgaged his, his house, his insurance policy on a project that everyone in Hollywood, including the trade papers, were calling Walt's Folly. He called it Walt's Folly. They called it Walt's Folly. He called it Snow White. Everyone thought it was absurd. Who would sit through a full-length cartoon? If Snow White hadn't succeeded, probably nobody on this uh, Zoom call would have any idea who his name was, and his family's trajectory might have been quite a bit different. When Boeing went from military to commercial aircraft, which nobody asked them to do, they didn't have an order, they too bet the farm on their first commercial airplane. No success, no Boeing. I thought it was just that simple. Kaizen here, innovation here. Till I came across a horrible statistic in the newspaper. Some of you may remember this. It was uh, in the other side of your state. Um, when um, a value jet um, had a crash in Florida, 100 and some odd people died in the Everglades. It said in the paper it took value jet only three years to get to the same size Southwest took 25 years to reach. Now, Southwest, by many metrics, is one of the most successful airlines on the planet. What was their dream? When they started, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, and that took them two years to get off the ground from the time they had an airplane, and slowly and incrementally built not just a national set of destinations, but a way of managing their fuel, their finances, and their people. Value Jet, in their haste to get to that same objective, developed none of those tools, skills, processes along the way, and the result was a disaster by every reckoning. So taking nothing away from the courage of Boeing or Disney, in both cases, they had spent a decade or more developing a set of skills that made that leap into innovation more likely to succeed. So Kaizen and innovation may not be completely separate, but first cousins. Just a little bit about Kaizen and relationships. Now, John Gottman is by most criteria the most successful marriage counselor in the world, and primarily a researcher. He's studied about 5,000 couples, I believe. What makes his work extraordinary is he can sit you down at the time of this publication for a 15-minute interview, and now a five-minute interview with your fiance, predict the likelihood you'll be happily married four years later versus miserable or divorced with 93% accuracy. 
you impressed? Basically, he found two things. One was how couples deal with conflict, not surprising. Some of what he found was common sense, some of it quite unusual. But the second thing he found is positive attention outweighed negative on a daily basis by five positive to one negative on the days when the relationship wasn't going well, 20 to one on the days when the relationship was thriving. What's he talking about? 20 candlelight dinners, 20 trips to the movies. You couldn't even physically accomplish it takes us back to small moments. When you call your mate during the day, does their voice light up when they realize it's you or does their voice tone imply you're interrupting more important tasks? Do they put down the remote control of the newspaper or the telephone when you come through the door? If you went to the dentist this morning, do they remember to ask you about it tonight? If you said you were going to be home at six, are you home or calling to say you've been delayed? Those small trivial moments accumulating throughout the day were more predictive of success than anything else the couple could do. In Gottman's own words, turning towards your spouse in little ways is also the key to long-lasting romance. Many people think the secret to reconnecting with their partner is a candlelight dinner or by the sea vacation, but the real secret is to turn towards each other in little ways each day. <coughs> Kaizen and social change. I just want to go through one of these because, as you know, no matter who the president is, if there's an issue, it's a, something we're going to spend trillions on with big programs, and sometimes that's necessary. But some of the most dramatic changes in our culture have occurred in, through small steps. I just want to give you one example. The, the, farm, the agricultural system in 1900 was pretty much where our health care system is today. Very expensive, very inefficient but with many stakeholders for who are doing fine with the system just the way it is. So by 1900, almost half of them went to food. Literally half the population of the United States was working on farms. Crop yields were in, unpredictable. When you went to the stores, it was gonna be a surprise to see what was on the shelf. But again, farmers were doing very well. <laughs> so that as the newfound agricultural science was increasing, there was no particular incentive or interest on their part uh, to adapt it. Uh, till a gentleman with an odd name with the Department of Agriculture decided to use what we're now calling Kaizen. He went to a small town in East Texas, found one farmer that turned over 70 of his 700 acres um, to these newfound agricultural uh, benefits. At the end of the season in 1900, $700, as you can imagine, was a lot of money. You can also imagine the conversation he had the day after harvest and these $700 in his pocket, the conversation he had with the other farmers in the coffee shop. He then announced he would do it at his farm and one county, one state at a time, we've developed the most efficient agricultural system in the history of the world. A little bit on mistakes. Now, this researcher at the University of Michigan has studied what they call high reliability organizations, nuclear power plants, aircraft carriers, emergency departments, places where the systems are extremely complex and the price of error could be catastrophic in terms of human. Basically, he found two things. One was, and it's a whole different conversation, how do you make it safe for your employees to bring their fears, their doubts, their mistakes to higher ups? How do you make that safe? And the other is they look for mistakes while they were so small and trivial, they seem inconsequential. <clears throat> There's a story in the book that I've actually talked to some people that uh, validated it about an aircraft carrier off the coast of Virginia that was practicing takeoff and landings. One mechanic couldn't find a wrench. He was pretty sure it wasn't on deck, but he couldn't be positive since he couldn't find it. The wrench could get sucked into an airplane, destroying the plane, the pilot, and God knows what else. So he went and told his command, his, uh, his superior officer, I can't find the wrench. He told the CO, they canceled the maneuver, the planes in the air flew back and landed in Norfolk, the aircraft carrier came back into the dock. Next day, they called the General Assembly, 1,100 sailors in dress white. The Admiral came on board. And what do you think they did to this mechanic? They gave him an award. Now, again, there was sloppiness. He should have known where the, it was. But, if you, but the message to these other 1,100 sailors, if you think you screwed up and you tell us, we can keep it from getting bigger. If you don't tell us, we'll have to wait till there's a colossal mess. So identifying mistakes. I won't give you time to read this. This was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that we're still cleaning up. Um, I'll ask you to go down to the very bottom sentence. Some of the signs that the reassurance was misplaced took place with small spills. There were 356 small spills before that night when 11 people died and the Gulf was poisoned. 
So again, looking for small skills. This is one of my favorite examples. Those of you that um, <coughs> know about David Lee Roth and Van Halen, the rock group. David Lee Roth's insistence that Van Halen's contracts with concert promoters contain a clause specifying that a bowl of M&Ms had to be provided backstage, but with every single brown candy removed upon pain of forfeiture of the show with full compensation to the band. At least once Van Halen followed through preemptively canceling the show in Colorado when Roth found some brown M&Ms in his dressing room. Now this sounds like the petty um, demands of a self-absorbed, perhaps drug-addled uh, drug star, rock star, but let's take it a step deeper. Van Halen was the first band to take huge productions into tertiary third-level markets. We'd pull up nine wing, nine 18 wheeler trucks full of gear where the standard was three trucks max and there were many many technical errors when i'd walk backstage if i saw a brown m m in the bowl he wrote well we would line check the entire production guaranteed you're going to arrive at a technical error guaranteed you're going to run into a problem does that not put it in a different context all right so um <coughs> going back to toyota um Think about some big mistake you made in your life, some mistake you would have given anything not to make. Yes, you learned from it and haven't done it again, but if you could have learned the lesson without paying such a price, you would have given it. From. Anybody remember that? Well, what does that have to do with the Toyota assembly line? When, when, the, when Deming and Tichi Ona rebuilt the assembly line, they decided they were going to do something very different. Because prior to that, every automobile assembly line was the same. A car would go down the assembly line and then quality control people at the end of the line would go over the car to see if there were mistakes. And the difference between Ford and Ferrari is how many people and how much time they spent reviewing the car to make sure it wasn't a mistake. And those of us with gray hair, remember it didn't matter how much you paid for a car, you took it back within the first month with several problems. For example, the clock never worked in the car. But they said never again. They put a cord, as you saw in that first video of the of the uh, news program. They put what they called and in cords. You're putting on the right front tire. You see scratches on the fender. You pull the cord, stop the assembly line. The supplier comes in. The engineer comes down, and they said, "Let's fix it here." We start it up again. Paula's putting on the back tire. She sees that the seats are wobbling. They're not in right. Pull the cord again. Everybody thought Deming and Teichi Ona were crazy. How can you mass manufacture a product when you're starting every, stopping every few yards to fix it? It turned out to be the most efficient way to build cars and people have copied it. What's the point of it? That mistake that you made that you would have given anything not to make, were there not small signs along the way that things were not going exactly the way you wanted, but you were so much in a hurry to get that relationship or that job or that product, whatever it was, that you ignored these small mistakes until they got to be so big, you had to have a recall of your life. The other thing Toyota did, and it's because I work in a medical center, we see a lot of people on partial disability. Um, one of the things that Toyota did that was quite extraordinary is they, if somebody had, for example, repetitive industry in their shoulder, they didn't send them home. They put them in the office where they could lick stamps or do something else, <clears throat> which was good for the employee's morale and <clears throat> um, had all kinds of positive benefits in terms of their disability costs. So again, something I found very interesting since we spent a lot of time trying to convince people to go back to work. <clears throat> now, this is an interesting book that looked at 11 Fortune 500 firms that for 15 years with the stock market average, next 15 years, seven times the stock market average, comparing them to firms that stayed average for that 20-year window. Uh, just a quote at the end of the book. We kept thinking we'd find the one big thing, the miracle moment that defined breakthrough. We even pushed for it in our interviews, but the good to great executive simply could not pinpoint a single key event or moment in time that exemplified the transition. <coughs> Frequently, they chafed against the whole idea of allocating points and prioritizing factors. In every good to great company, at least one of the interviewees gave them a prompted admonishment saying something along the lines of, look, you can't dissect this thing into a series of nice little boxes and factors or an identifying moment of aha or the one big thing. It was a whole bunch of interlocking pieces that built one upon another. No matter how dramatic the end result, the good to great transformation never happened in one fell swoop. There was no single defining action, no grand program, no one killer innovation, no solitary lucky break, no wrenching revolution. 
good to great comes about by cumulative process, step by step, action by action, decision by decision, turn by turn of the flywheel that adds up to sustained and spectacular results. And Jeff Bezos, a name I think you've heard, um, his rise into Fortune 500 actually has little to do with innovation and more to do with iteration. If anything, Amazon demonstrates how a cutting edge internet company of all things can succeed slowly. The trick is taking a million tiny steps and learning quickly from your missteps. <coughs> so we go from the motto, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, to the notion by the yard it's hard, by the inch it's a cinch. And again, Pat Riley, months, the basketball coach from the uh, Lakers and Miami Heat. Months later, we got taught a simple truth. Anytime you stop striving to get better, you're bound to get worth. Worse, there's no such thing in life as simply holding on to what you got. What we mean here by striving is not large desperate steps but small trivial ones. So there's three things that make Kaizen difficult in closing besides our focus, our cultural focus on innovation and big steps. One is it takes enormous self-esteem. If you're like me and most people I know, we tend to make personal changes in our lives only in the face of a crisis or those decade birthdays where you take stock of your life and think maybe you put the emphasis in the wrong place or a relationship ends or some other tragedy makes you rethink your priorities. And at those moments, many of us are very angry with ourselves and our, the small steps are the last thing we think of. If we can make a big change yesterday, that would be a perfect. Today's tolerable, tomorrow seems like an eternity away. If you've got a harsh voice in your head, it's very hard to make so, uh, to tolerate small steps because the harsh step wants to change instantly. Now, I'm, I would wager most of you on this Zoom process have that harsh voice, but aren't even aware of it because it's been there all their life, all your lives. Let me see if I convince you. Um, how many of you consider rejection painful? I assume all of you. I'm going to try and convince you that's not possible. Ready? Now, rejection comes in many, many forms, but romantic rejection is one form. And even that has many variations. So see if you would agree this is one variation. So I uh, suppose I go up to Paula and I say, Paula, would you like to go out with me Saturday night? And Paula says, you know, Bob, I'd love to go out with you, but I'm busy flossing on Saturday night. That's, that's rejection that hurts, yes? Uh, <coughs> um, let's see if that's what happened. I went up to Paula, asked her out. She gave me that lame excuse. As I walked away, which of these two voices do you think happened spontaneously, automatically in the center of my head? Door number one. Boy, Bob, am I proud of you. Nice try. That was gutsy. Could have been a little smoother. Next time you'll do better. I am so proud of you for trying. All the time, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, 300 voices in the center of my head singing the Hallelujah Chorus because of my willingness to live at risk and pursue my dreams. Door number one as I walked away or door number two. Boy, did you sound like a jerk. Who wants to go out with you? You're old, you're ugly, you're fat. Nobody likes you anyway. Which is more likely, one or two? Two, yes. Where was the pain? And Paul is saying no to the conversation in my head walking away. Now, does that voice show up at the best of times or worst of times? Usually the worst of times. Now, how that voice got there and how to change it would be a topic for another day. But if, like most of us, you've got that harsh voice, it's not interested at all in small steps. It also takes optimism. The Kaizen steps are so ridiculously small, they don't look like they're going to get you there in this lifetime. What you're counting on is Kaizen works in two ways. If the steps are so small, they don't require willpower, self-control, discipline, then it becomes much easier to do. There's a classic study that was done in Pittsburgh and then in Ireland, huge high-rise building. <clears throat> you folks are on the fourth floor, and a, a manufacturing firm, we identify a dozen of your employees that haven't exercised since high school. And we say, congratulations, here is a lifetime gift certificate to that beautiful health club on the first floor. Here is a second gift certificate for your trainer for a year. Here's your third gift certificate. As you go into that health club, there's a gift shop there. You can get an entirely new wardrobe. Here's the American Heart Association recommendations, 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Go to the 12th floor, say a law firm, identify another dozen people that haven't exercised since high school. All you ask them to do on Monday is go into the stairwell, go up one flight of stairs, back to their floor, back to their desk, back to work. Tuesday, go into the stairwell, go up a flight at a single step, back to your floor, back to your desk, back to work. Wednesday, one flight, two steps. You get the idea every day of the work week, adding one step to this ridiculous regimen. 
but come back one year, three years, five years later, which of these two groups do you think is exercising better, better weight loss, cardiovascular fitness, lower cholesterol? The group with the steppers. It took new, well, new willpower, self-control, and discipline, and eventually they developed a habit. Now, the other way Kaizen works is you're programming the brain for the leap you wanted to make. Example, how many of you remember the exact instant, the exact moment when you master driving? Almost nobody does. You vaguely remember being on an empty grocery store parking lot with a car that's lurching and a parent's losing control of their mental health while you're trying to figure out how am I going to steer, brake, shift, and deal with traffic at the same time. But you know at a certain point you're driving down the highway, completely absorbed by the radio, the conversation with your passenger, oblivious to the fact the brain is now making moment-to-moment -moment life-saving decisions with no conscious effort on your part. You learned it incrementally, the brain made the leap into mastery on its own. So Kaizen takes optimism because there's just no guarantee in the, in the immediate results that this is working. And the other thing is it takes vision. Kaizen so powerful, it'll take you where you are going, so you want to be careful where you point it. I'll give you two examples, one more personal, one more business. The personal one, I have an opportunity to work at this health spa about a dozen times a year in Tucson. I know it's a hard gig, but somebody has to do it. And sometimes people come there in a state of crisis. They're, again, a relationship ended, they didn't even know it was in trouble or a doctor scared them with a diagnosis. And sometimes because of the harsh voice or just their distraction, they injure themselves on a piece of equipment or on a hiking trail. And I have the opportunity to talk with them while they're getting uh, uh, treated. And I'll say, well, what brought you to the spa? And they give me examples like those ones I gave you. And I'll say, well, what were you hoping to accomplish before you got injured? And the answers are usually fairly similar. I want to, I want to, I want to feel better. I want to um, be able to exercise. I want to wake up in the morning with energy. I want to look better in clothes. I want to be happier. Happiness always shows up somewhere on that list. So if your goal is to be happy, exercise isn't necessarily the best path. All my proof of this is those grocery store magazines you see at the checkout counter every week of the year, there's usually somebody on the cover who's achieved that level of fitness, let alone fame and fortune, and other challenges have shown up in their life. While fitness is a very worthy goal, as the path to happiness is quite limited. So while you're at this house spa for a limited amount of time, can you find some way to make you happy while you're moving your body? If you think about it, what was our favorite part of school? recess. We couldn't wait to get out and move our body. We wanted to be excused from the dinner table so we could go out and play. And most of us have lost that joy in moving our body. And so while you're at this health spa, can you find a way to move even a minute or two at a time that gives you pleasure? Because that pleasure will compete with your other activities when you go back to your very overcommitted lives. If it's one more chore on top of a life that's already chore full, it's going to fall down to you come back to the spa. Let me give you more business example. How many of you remember that summer where Ford Explorer and Firestone tires had some kind of engineering flaw and something like 150 people died as these SUVs turned over? So if we go back to that summer and I say to you, Firestone's one of the most successful makers of car tires. In the context of that summer, would that seem rather strange to you? I would think so. But during that same window of time, when those uh, tires and something in the car failed, Firestone Fire Fire sold over 2 million tires that did exactly what they promised to do. That's a lot of success. So if your vision as a company is you're in the tire business, it's gonna take you quite a while to pay any attention because people die every day in car accidents. What if your vision as a company, and you know there's companies that talk this way, was to make safe rubber products for family transportation? What if that was your vision? How many deaths before you wanted to at least take a second look? First one. All right. <clears throat> so again, this idea of small steps is not something new. People have been uh, suggesting this for quite a long time. So I'm trying to see where we are with time. We've got five minutes. Um, <clears throat> So um, I want to give you a chance to play with this. So what I'll ask you to do for just about, I see we got, it's 825, I'll give you about three. Do we have, um, is um, Bob still with us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Bob. Yeah. Uh, can we put people in a group for just sure. three minutes? Okay. Because uh, uh, what I'll ask you to do in your group is just ask the question twice. 
ask your partner to choose which one you think will be easiest. Um, Because I'm not asking you to make a commitment today. I'm just asking you to see if you can think small the same way as you think big. And then uh, you'll ask, so suppose my, I'm, I'm, my partner says, which is easiest for you, Bob? And I say, health. So my partner is going to ask me the same question twice. Bob, what small trivial step could you take that may improve the quality of your health? I'll come up with some area where willpower, self-control, discipline just hasn't done the trick. Can I come up with a step so ridiculously small? I'm sure I can do it. The way you know you have a good Kaizen step is people laugh in your face. So I'll give you an example. Suppose I want to be flossing, never get around to it. So I could say to my partner, I'm going to floss one tooth a night, same tooth. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Assuming it's so small, I'm sure I can do it. I'm as sure of that as I am. The sun's coming up tomorrow because it takes no willpower, no self-control, no discipline. What do I have a month from now? Besides one clean tooth, smart Alec. I have a habit of picking up that silly string. The chance of the other uh, teeth getting um, uh, clean becomes much greater. So you just have a couple minutes to do this, three minutes, and then I just want to close with a quote from Mother Teresa. All All right. right. So groups of three. Yep, I'll send them out. Okay, so we'll get you back in three minutes. You want this at 1129, Bob? I'll bring that. Yep. I'll just wrap it up with a quote. Yeah. People on their way. Good stuff, Bob. Very good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wow. Do you think you've got the number of participants that signed up? Because it looked like 15, but I know some of them were in, in group settings. Yeah, some of them were in group settings. So, yeah, I think we were at the number, but yeah, some of them were in with their teams. Okay. And again, I, as you know, I didn't leave time for questions. So if, if you want to give them my phone number, you're welcome to do that. They've got the website, so they can reach me. Through sure, there. yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I mention that. So let's see, I need to. Okay, I gave them 60 seconds. Perfect, thank you. All right. Again, if we had time, I'd love to hear if that was easy or hard for you. But again, Kaizen is a state of mind. It's an approach to life. It's a way of approaching an issue. Um, And as Deming said, it takes a while to build that in. I just want to close with a quote. Mother Teresa at one point went to Beirut. It was during one of their terrible civil wars. There was a group of very impaired children um, uh, that were trapped in a place that was under bombardment. Three Red Cross workers had been killed the day before trying to rescue them. And she came to Beirut and she ultimately did rescue them. And when they asked her why with all the things in the world that she could be doing, she was there. And this was the quote that gave, she gave, small things with great love. It is not how much we do, but how much love we put into the doing. And it is not how much we give, but how much love we put into the giving. To God, there's nothing small. So thank you, Bob, for this opportunity. And I hope this has been helpful. And if I can answer any questions, I'll be happy to do that offline. Thanks. Okay, very good. Um, 
And hey, everybody, I have uh, Bob's phone number if you want to give him a call. And otherwise, uh, the website was showing or you can reach out to Beth and get that. Uh, there'll be a copy of this available and there's a recording. So uh, thank everyone for attending and uh, thank you, Dr. Bob, for uh, being with us today. It's a great uh, session on Kaizen. Thank Thanks, you, everybody, and we'll uh, close up now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like, uh, great. Appreciate I would it. like oh, wait, to, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just like to remind everybody, and thank you so much, Bob, for this wonderful presentation. I just like to remind everybody uh, to look for our future webinars and events coming up on May 4th. We have a webinar on intellectual property for your business, and also a reminder to set your calendar for June 17th. That will be our 60th year award banquet for Bama. So uh, we will look forward to seeing everybody there. And again, thank you so much for attending. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.